Sarah, will you read to us? I'd love nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> hello, thank you for coming. I'm going to just read from the beginning of the book to give you a sense of how it looks and sounds. There are a lot of breaks in it, and um, here we go. A great photographer insists on writing poems. A brilliant essayist insists on writing novels. A singer with a voice like an angel insists on singing only her own terrible songs. So when people tell me I should try to write this or that thing I don't want to write, I know what they mean. <laughs> you might as well start by confessing your greatest shame. Anything else would just be exposition. It can be worth foregoing marriage for sex, and it can be worth foregoing sex for marriage. It can be worth foregoing parenthood for work, and it can be worth foregoing work for parenthood. Every case is orthogonal to all the others. That's the entire problem. Hold on one second, Sarah. Can we turn the treble down a little bit? I'm afraid it's going to squeal at you. Ready? Thank you. I assume the cadets are gay, but then I see they are merely unafraid of love. They're preparing to go to war, and with so little time to waste, they say what they mean. At faculty meetings, I sat next to people whose books had sold two million copies. Success seemed so close, just within reach. On subway benches, I sat next to people who were gangrenous, dying. But I never thought I'd catch what they had. <laughs> What's worse, offending someone or lying to someone? Saying something stupid when it's your turn or not saying anything? Tell me which and I'll tell you your problem. You the changed it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Read the real Should one. Should we chat about that? Yeah, now? let's. <laughs> Or should I keep reading? I I'm sorry, you should keep reading. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I was trying to remember whether the word at the end was sex or it gender. Was, it yeah, was sex. It was, yeah. And then it was the other. And then, and then, yeah. and then I just had to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren is my conversation partner tonight because he was the first person who said, yes, it, yes it's a book, and yes, I will take a run through it and present something that might be a coherent shape that maybe will, you know, kind of turn into a book at some point. And all those things did, in fact, happen. But in that early edit, there are a few stray words. I won't interrupt again. Found their way I won't. <laughs> I, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say that. I'm glad to say that. It's always a little awkward to just say hello and start reading. Could, could I just ask you to read that <laughs> aphorism again with the word sex at the end? Yes, argument. I'm sorry, argument. <laughs> TBD. Okay. All right, so um, outtake, early version. <laughs> B-side. What's worse, offending someone or lying to someone? Saying something stupid when it's your turn or not saying anything? Tell me which and I'll tell you your sex. Which Lauren prefers. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. The trouble with comparing yourself to others is that there are too many others. Using all others as your control group, all your worst fears and all your fondest hopes are at once true. You are good. You are bad. You are abnormal. You are just like everyone else. Some people ditch friends and lovers because it's easier to get new ones than to resolve conflicts with the old ones, particularly if resolving a conflict requires one to admit error or practice mercy. I'm describing an asshole, but what if the asshole thinks he's ditching an asshole? <laughs> Inner beauty can fade too. The water birds... <laughs> yeah, it's the short ones. People like, people like the short ones. People like the short ones the first time, but once they've read these a hundred times, they'll be trying not to laugh at the long ones, too. 
I don't know. So. It, I, I would skip the longest ones. In fact, I'm doing that right now for, <laughs> for those of you who are following, following along. The water birds near my house are in middle school. The coots' voices crack. The seagulls bully the ducks. The egret just got braces and stands humiliated by himself. Many bird names are onomatopoetic. They name themselves. Fish, on the other hand, just have to float there and take what they get. <laughs> I used to avoid people when I, when I was afraid I loved them too much. 10 years in one case. Then, after I had been married long enough that I was married even in my dreams, I became able to go to those people, to feel that desire, and to know it would stay a feeling. In a dream, my friend and I begin the act and both immediately want it to be over, but we have to continue impelled by some obscure reason. I wake wondering whether we could ever enjoy it. I think about it all day, really dedicate myself to it. I think about it for two more days, and that's how I fall in love with my friend. Like a vase, a heart breaks once. After that, it just yields to its flaws. In the morning, I wake amid fading scenes of different characters, different settings, all restatements of that first desire a ghost who haunts me as the beauty he was at 16. My friend learns Chinese and moves to China, but her limited vocabulary is good for grocery shopping, not for falling in love. When her heart breaks, she is obliged to ask, why won't you fuck me? I've put horses in poems, but I've never written one. They just seem like such a good thing to put into literature. Biographies should also contain the events that failed to foreshadow. I remember a girl who was famous in school for having woken from a drunken blackout and said to whoever was there, are you my judges? In real life, my healthy boyfriend said he envied my paralytic disease, that I'd earned the right to a legitimate nervous breakdown. A few years later, he was in an accident and became paralyzed from the neck down. That's just bad writing. It isn't so much that geniuses make it look easy, it's that they make it look fast. <laughs> of a page of perfect prose I read in a dream, I remember only this. Thank you, she said. Her simple answer concealed the truth. The man who had me in a phone booth married quickly after the affair ended. His novel had everything in it, the phone booth, the shame, the sash he sewed to wear over the surgical appliance in his belly. In the novel, it, co it covers a plaster leg cast. The front page of his website is a glowing glass phone booth standing alone in snow. <laughs> the book got bad reviews. He has two children. I never joined Facebook because I want to preserve my old longings and also yours. Hmm. Looking at you on this next one, the fastest way to, rev to revise a piece of work is to send it late at night to someone whose opinion you fear, <laughs> then rewrite it, praying you'll finish in time to send a new version by morning. <laughs> <laughs> Having a worst regret betrays your belief that one misstep caused all your undeserved misfortune. I don't write long forms because I'm not interested in artificial deceleration. As soon as I see the glimmer of a consequence, I pull the trigger. My teacher cried while I listened. None of his books had ever made money, not even the famous one, he said. He'd spent his life trying to write perfect books, and when he tried to make money, he, he couldn't. I didn't think I'd ever feel as old as he seemed at that moment, but here we are. <laughs> the difference between writers under 30 and writers over 40 is that the former, like everyone their age, already know how to act like famous people, people whose job it is to be photographed. 
I wish I could ask the future whether I should give up or keep trying. Then again, what if trying, even in the face of certain failure, feels as good as accomplishing? What if it's even better? And here we are again. Horror is terror that stayed the night. I can't bear to think of my dead friend, but I don't mind rereading a few things that have nothing to do with him and that always move me to tears. The grief reservoir empties to a manageable level. In this way, I can mourn him without having to think about him. There will come a time when people decide you've had enough of your grief and they'll try to take it away from you. You'll never know what your mother went through. I'm going to read about a half dozen more. I've known a few people who approached the act as a perfectible art. I've known some great perverts, too. Others were in love. Desire abandoned them all. It's the ones I didn't fuck or didn't fuck enough or haven't fucked enough that I still dream about. In ninth grade, I was too afraid to speak to the boy I loved, so I mailed him a black paper heart every week for a year. I wasn't afraid of him. I was afraid of my feeling. It was more powerful than God. If we'd ever spoken, it might have burned the whole place down. Shame needs an excuse to feel ashamed. It apologizes for everything, even itself. I've never seen a ghost, and I don't believe in them. I might see one tonight, but even then I wouldn't believe in ghosts. I'd believe in that ghost. Just before the poetry reading starts, I ask the overgrown boy sitting next to me why he likes poetry, what happened to him, and he says, I went to war. The affair is over, but at least things have gone somewhere, if only into oblivion. And maybe oblivion is what I wanted all along. The dark owns everything, but our sun comes out often enough that we think the universe is half dark, half light. When the worst comes to pass, the first feeling is relief. I'll stop there. Thank you. I think that's <clears throat> give or take a half dozen exactly what you made of the 300 pieces that I gave you that were in the, at the time in alphabetical order, which was the only way I could deal with them mm. up until that point. And when, when, you, when you did that, I was able to see a way to put them, put them together in, in a way that wasn't just insane. You know, mm. it, it's like all the A's, the B's. Um, it's funny. They I've I've read those a bunch of times. Hi. Hi, I've read those a bunch of times, um, and I don't remember any of them verbatim. But I think about them all the time. Two nights ago, a man at a party was telling me about a drug called DMT. Do you know about DMT? Yeah. You trip harder than you trip on anything, but it only lasts for five, five minutes. Five seconds. Yeah. Oh, five right. minutes. And then you come back, and he said, if you go far enough into it, apparently everyone has the same experience. They see little metallic people wow. who are coming to welcome them on the trip. And I thought, I don't believe in ghosts. I believe in that ghost. Wow, that was the only thing I could think of. But these come up. <laughs> I, earlier today, I was going through to look for ones that I, wanted to, that I wanted to tell you had meant especially much to me. And then I realized that almost all of them I think about a lot. The regret one, maybe especially. But I know them so well now that I, I've noticed, I think, every time that you've changed them, why did you go from desire, relinquish them all, to desire, abandon them all? It seemed more accurate. But relinquish is such a beautiful, you know, antique word. Mm. It seems more appropriate in this setting to say relinquish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, yeah, certainly in the beginning, I was thinking of them as individual pieces. And so I think relinquished 
belonged to that piece, but mm. once they became embedded in something that toward the end became all but unbreakable, this, this one thing made out of 300 other things, I think certain things had to change. You couldn't have little spiky, pretty curly cues. There are, there are def there's a little Rococo, <laughs> there are Rococo bits, but there are, few, I could tolerate fewer of them. Mm -hmm. The word Rococo is in there, though. I, 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 now, I now remember. I was thinking, oh, that's such a great word. Oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, one with, the one with the word Rococo in it actually takes place at the um, Paris Review office. So a little backstory on that one. Um, yeah. Tell me, why did you end up calling the, these arguments? Oh. Do we, I, will you tell them the, the, the the variant titles? Yeah. Uh, some of them were, well, you know, it, it was called either Last Words or 300 Arguments from the very beginning. And then I decided it was 300 Arguments. And then after, again, another Paris Review Party, not the same one that I was just talking about, you and Donald Antrim shamed me for wanting to call a book 300 Arguments, not, not you so much as, as Donald, and it's fine, he's a genius, but, um, uh, but after that night I thought, oh, shit, you know, you can't, you can't call a book 300 Arguments, it's just, it's just bad. So then I really started spiraling, and I, I had about eight or nine people that I sent variant titles to every week for a year, approximately. I don't know if any of them are here right now. Um, Okay, uh, uh, black paper hearts, um, you know, they're terrible. I, I tried to pick, um, oh, there was something like, uh, there's, there's one that includes um, a 16th century villa, and so it was sort of like stones, oh, broken stones, 300 artifacts, um, uh, 300 Failure, you know, I, I, I was still very attached to the idea of there being 300 of something because I was very pleased with myself for having summoned exactly 300, which I had wanted to do from the beginning. Um, you, we'll and, get to the beginning in this. I, 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 oh, I, I sure. have a question about that, but I, I don't mean to interrupt. And, and then finally, in order to sort of support, I mean, this is all like an interior conflict. I think everybody I knew knew I was going to call it 300 arguments, and it was absolutely fine to call it 300 arguments. <laughs> Um, apologies to Donald Antrim, but I put together this list of all of the definitions of the word argument, you know, like from my Latin grammar, like the really old ones that have fallen out of use and fallen, really fallen out of easy association. And there are 15 of them, and I'll, I'll read them to you. Subject, theme, sign, mark, token, proof, hint, plot, Declaration, evidence, burden, complaint, accusation, denouncement, and betrayal. And Those are definitions of the Latin. The arguo, the the old root that mm -hmm. gave us the word argument. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I'm very, you know, I'm not a classicist. I'm very happy to kind of mush them all together and 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 just know, you know, it was like I was clutching them in a little purse the whole time I was finishing this book, thinking. If all of those things can belong to that word, then I'm, I will be satisfied calling it 300 arguments. Um, it's been interesting, you know, you sort of like l look, give a little side eye to like a, a review that talks about the title. And, and um, I, I have a very practical husband who said, no one's going to get it. You, you know, you. Um, and then I suggested, well, should I have a frontispiece where I list everything? And he's like, no, no, the design. He's a designer, so. Um, and he said, just know that nobody's going to get it, and you're going to have to explain. And I said, well, I love explaining. That's like my whole job is explaining. So, um, so it's okay that, um, yeah, yeah, it's it, it's a little odd, I guess, but. Um, it's come to seem completely natural. As I, you I say, feel it's very intimate. I feel it. yeah. I feel very intimate with this new way of thinking about. If the it's word, perverse, so. it's per it's deeply perverse. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so so how did the how did how did you come to write a book of these little arguments? I was writing a different book, 
What was it supposed I, to be? I was writing a real book. This was um, a book that, that felt so real. It was a book that I uh, sort of envisioned before it existed, which I'd never really done before. Uh, usually I just kind of write notes for a few years and then like pluck something out of, out of that. But I, ha I turned 40 and I decided to take the very good advice that people had been giving me, editors, other people, it was time to write a long book, a big book, a magnum opus, you know, a tall book, a, an important book. And in fact, I have been trying to write exactly such a book for at least the last 15 years about bigotry and whiteness and my family and Boston and class and the founding families and just, you know, the, that obviously was going to be my big book. And so it's a Boston book. Yeah, I, yeah, and I call it the Boston book mm -hmm. in, when I talk about it to myself. <laughs> and as I, you know, and I, I've written several books now instead of the Boston book. Um, this one <coughs> began as, um, you know, I'm, the, the fact that I can't really describe the Boston book except by naming like eight abstract nouns indicates that I don't really know what it's about and I don't really know what I'm doing and it's very tiring to stay in that space. Um, but it sounds generative, the Boston book is. It, yeah, it generates everything except itself. Except itself. <laughs> yes. And so I started writing these very tiny, complete thoughts, because I needed to have a complete thought. And What was the first one that you wrote? Oh, I have no idea. Wouldn't it, I really should just lie and say <laughs> it was whatever one is your favorite one. Your favorite one? Well, I, I'm sorry, so you wrote one. I wrote, it wasn't, it, I'm, I'm making it sound a little bit uh, neater than it was. Mm -hmm. I wrote maybe 20 of them, you know, hither and yon, not as a project or anything. And At the beginning I, of the workday, to focus? Or? All different times. Uh -huh. I wrote them fast, I wrote, I, I'd spend a whole day on one, I wrote them in my diary, I wrote them as something else. Um, would you th think, would you be working on the wording during, as you walked around? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I usually sit mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. when I work. I'm not a walker, um, but I'm a talker, which mm -hmm. is why I can't have an office like next to somebody else's office. There's this wonderful mm -hmm. thing at the, the public library, the Coleman Grant, which I can never apply for because I have to sing and talk. I mean, I sound insane, but, um, but I sit still. Yeah. I. And then I had 200 of them. And then I thought, or, or no, it's more like 150. See, I can't tell a story. This is why I write books like this. At 150, I thought, OK, I'll try to get to 200. Oh, that was easy. I'll try to get to 300. Oh, that was hard. I guess I'll stop. Mm -hmm. But even then, I wasn't thinking of it as a book. I, I really like Jenny Holzer's Truisms project. And I've had it on posters uh, around me for the last 12 years, we've moved a lot of times, but it's, it's always like the first thing that I need to like have on the wall in the house. Um, these are distillations of Eastern and Western philosophy into one-liners one in sans serif font on eight large posters, like the size of an oil portrait, like that one. Um, and in a way, this, this was my homage to the Holzer. And I didn't think I was making posters either, but I, I, and when I finally sent it to you, I really thought, maybe this will be something that runs in a magazine, mm -hmm. not anything more than that. And then it became that thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I understand you called my book editor and suggested that it might be a book. Did I really? You really did, yeah. <laughs> Where did I get the chutzpah? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you do that all the time. No. No, but I like it. I like it better than Holzer. I'm glad he. I'm glad he did that. Um, did the, is there, will the attentive reader find stories that are buried? I think so. Um, I, I didn't try to bury them, but I did try to provide momentum that will take you from the first to the 300th. Yeah. 
what kind of, what kinds of technique can get you from one? I want to explain something to those of you who haven't read these before. It's a little bit misleading to hear them read because they work like jokes. Um, but when you read them to yourself, they are much faster. They're really fast. And they're very funny so that you, you find yourself laughing more in private than I think you, than you feel cued to do in public. Because they have a funny, well, they have a funny relation to jokes because they're much mm. faster than jokes. The punchlines happen. You, you don't realize it was the punchline until you step back and look at the line before, and then you understand, oh, um, the, like the one about that you read, we all knew that there was something funny because of the phone booth, but then you said it, he has, the book got bad reviews, he has two children. Mm -hmm. But um, bump. The but um, bump doesn't work out loud, especially really? as a joke, but oh. on the page you think, what, what does that have to do with, and then you think, oh. How, you know, what's the status of the children versus the book? How important is the book? Was he kidding? You know, is the he website kidding has been changed since it, <laughs> since it uh, was published in the in the magazine. I assumed you made that part up. What? I assumed you made that part up. No, it's all true. It's all true. <laughs> did you tell anybody about the? Did you check with anybody about the? A lady never tells. <laughs> <laughs> Except. I did check with a good friend of mine yeah. about one yeah. that is no longer in the, in okay. the group. Yeah. I thought it was untraceable. It really wasn't. But yeah. my friend is very, very careful yeah. and very, yeah. yeah. My friend deserved to be able to say that. But um, I'm, I'm sorry. No. I started yammering, but I wanted to oh. ask you what kinds of technique oh, you found momentum. to get things moving. Yeah. yeah. So after it was broken out of its alphabetical form, I was able to see that they could be grouped. I mean, it, it felt very um, distressing to have to put 300 things in order. But to put 50 things in order is manageable. And I came up with seven groups, seven themes or sections, and, um, and then put them in alphabetical order within the sections because, you know, I, I, li I like order. What were the, I forget, what the were sections, the sections? I don't know if I ever told you the sections. They're um, in order as they appear in, in the book now or, or as they're, you know, sort of, this is the invisible scaffolding that is no longer in the book. Um, the ones about the self uh, begin and then the ones about others desire, um, art, work, failure, and death. Right. But the ones they, about know, the, death they are actually, all about those death. Those rubrics were in, the, in a version that I saw. Okay. I remember you were, oh, the, you were the wondering titles whether themselves. there should be rubrics in the, yeah. in the book. But it's kind of nice not to have them because how do you, it's like a librarian's nightmare. Which ones are the self ones and which ones are the death I know. ones? You know? I know exactly. Yes, and which ones are and the, the others ones and the and failure? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, and and also, I remember, if you, if you don't mind my saying so, I remember that the failure ones got a little bit relentless. Yeah, yeah. it's true. I did cut. Um, I think I probably cut more from that section oh, really? than the others, um, with the help of several astute readers, including my book editor, Ethan Mazowski. Um, I, I still have a list of the ones that he cut and the ones that you cut. They're like color-coded. <clears throat> and, um, you know, of course, I'm still not writing the Boston book, and I'm, I'm writing more of these, and I, I've resurrected a few that you cut. Uh, so I'll see so if, see be, if maybe you cut them again. 300 more arguments? Um, hey, that's a catchy title. 300 more arguments <laughs> about Boston. Oh, God, no, no that's, no, oh, no. please, no. <laughs> no, the Boston book, maybe the Boston book is this, like, this haunted book that just sort of, like, you know, impels me to, you know, the power of it impels me to write other books. I was telling a painter friend about this, um, and she told me that many painters keep a whipping boy, a canvas, um, you know, that sort of, hilariously 
called the whipping boy, where they, you know, if they really need to use a certain brush or a certain color, but it's not going to work with what they're working mm. with, they just put it on that. I love that. That's great. I love that idea. Yeah. It's sort of, I guess it's like the opposite, it's the opposite for, of, of, the of what boss. I have. Yeah. Um, which I thought you were going to say they have a, a masterpiece, you know, like in the Zola, that they have a mm. masterpiece behind the curtain oh, right. that they go and work <laughs> on that yeah. never works. Yep. And then they go and work on their. Yeah, no, like that's my work. thing. Yeah, that's my yeah. thing. That's your thing. Um, no, but it was interesting to. I Did other, when you were. Some of, the, some of the arguments, why don't you like the, calling them aphorisms? Well, some of them are aphorisms, but many of them aren't. Mm -hmm. Anecdote, yeah. manifesto, myth. I mean, there, there's a whole section about um, my strong feelings about language and form um, that just sort of all, all got in. There's something I overheard in a bar. You know, I, <coughs> there, I wanted to be able to see how many different things I could make. If I had to make something small, how varied could I make it? Oh. And um, there, are, there are a few people who I think can get away with writing a book of aphorisms. Don Patterson, the Scottish writer, is one. Mm -hmm. But even James Richardson, who I think is possibly the best aphorist alive right now, calls his aphorisms and 10-second essays, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is perfect for what he does. Yeah. So, some of them are about why small. Yes. Some of them are arguments about smallness. Mm -hmm. But I can't help thinking that some of them, like the one that you crossed out that you didn't want to read mm -hmm. because it's a little bit too long, mm -hmm. knowing your other work, I can't help thinking that probably it was hard for you sometimes not to start writing a story a longer story out hmm. of the aphorism. Is that not, or the, uh, out of the you anecdote? I haven't been listening at all. No? <laughs> um, I, can, I, can write a, no, I can write a story if it's 100 words, yeah. but I can't write a long, I mean, the longest thing I can write is really like a thousand word, a thousand word compositional unit, and then maybe sort of block a bunch of those together into something longer. But it, it is true that there are, there are probably more anecdotes which are stories, I guess, stories. in here than the other forms. Yeah. The really short ones stand out because there are fewer of them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, did you not ever feel that you were being taken away from this project by any of the any of the any of the ideas that came to you? No. Oh. You no. You know, the first one is a little bit about you. I, I'm going to answer your question. You're one of the people along with so many novelists and editors of novels, who says, you should write a novel. And you have this beautiful idea of the novel that I wish I could write. Mm -hmm. You know, after I came back from Rome, he said, just write it about, write it about that, it'll be funny and mean, and just write it about the American Academy and make it a novel. And I tried, I yes, I tried. You said, call it The Fellowship. <laughs> and I, I even wrote it. I even wrote, I wrote a lot of it. But in the end, I just, um, yeah. I just don't make novels. I just yeah. can't. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It just it dies in me before, yeah. before it happens. You pull the trigger. But it's very interesting to think. Well, it's very interesting to hear that you think I'm capable of writing long narrative. Probably you're right, but I cannot access that ability. I guess I'm thinking about, about. Uh, the, the two kinds of decay, a book that's made up of small pieces, mm -hmm. but that tells a very complicated, uh, that covers a very complicated and long part of life, of your life. That's true. So that, so I, when I see an ongoingness too, there's, um, it's one story. It's one story made up of pieces. Mm -hmm. And that's why I imagine little, underground rivulets in this book that are hidden stories that I could imagine you coming back. Maybe, maybe it didn't work like this at all, but I'd imagine you coming back and thinking, maybe, you know, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't cover this part about grieving. Maybe there's more to be said. Well, there's definitely more to be said about grieving, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, th there are certainly more 
habits of writing in this book that I'm than I, than I am aware of that mm -hmm. an astute reader would see. Um, there is only one that contradicts that that directly contradicts another one, and I put them right next to each other. Um, and I have this fantasy that I'm about to find it right now. Um, yeah. You didn't know them by heart. No, I'm, a ter I'm terrible at that. Um, I was even terrible at that. All the years that I had the, the holsters hanging in my house, I'd go out and you know, talk about something that I like is Jenny Holzer, and I have, the, I have these eight pieces. And, and people, of course, would immediately say, oh, there are about two, three hundred of them. What are your favorite ones? Or can you recite one? And I can't recite a single one because I, I would, but it sounds like nothing without the other 290, you know, however, mm -hmm. around them. Mm -hmm. And this is the same problem I have when people ask me, what's your favorite anything? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to look for a little bit longer. Um, but no, I'm, I'm terrible at having to choose. I'm terrible at having to, having to pick. Um, yeah, I can't find it, but um, it's, about about to, suffering. it's about suffering. I was about to vamp for you for a little while. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. I, I fear that I'll just be doing that for forever. One thing, one preoccupation, soon we can open it up for questions, but oh, um, one preoccupation that has stuck with me is the sense, the, the critique, the very funny critique of the idea of specialness. Mm -hmm. So the anecdote that, that you laugh at on the page about being next to the bestseller in the faculty meeting and thinking that properly belongs to me and then not feeling mm -hmm. the proximity. Yeah. I don't, give me time to work on it and no, I'll no, say that. No, no, I know. And then. You know what I was thinking. I know what you were thinking. <laughs> um, and then. And then the thing about how having one big regret, mm -hmm. all, that one thing is the cause of all of one's yeah. undeserved suffering. Yeah. I love that word, yeah. undeserved. Misfortune. Anyway, mis misfortune, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I have more things to ask her, but are there any questions? You're so funny, and your writing is so funny. Thank you. But your picture is so serious. Yeah, I picked that one. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. like a, it's the most like recent one. Oh, like a what? Like a straight man? You oh, like a straight, straight man? Funny, straight. Yeah. Well, I, maybe I, I think I would love to be a straight man. <laughs> it just seems so easy. No, I, I really... Yeah. Um, you know, there's someone in the audience who I've known for a very long time, Charlotte, and um, the, first, the, the first author photo I ever took, um, yeah, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know. It was, didn't, it, it, uh, I don't use it anymore. And she said, it looks like you're trying to meet boys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, really, it's really hard to get it right, you know, especially... Um, you know, if you're female, all that bullshit. Um, so I no, I'm, I actually I, I'm glad to have a moment to just kind of air that. Uh, <laughs> it's just, yeah. You can ask me anything, or Lauren. I want to hear the end of the story of how you cooked it in order. <sighs> you know, I just complained about it a lot and refused to do it and um, tried to make a lot of other people do it, like do the whole thing. No one, nobody would because 300 things, it's too, it's too many, it's unmanageable. Um, and you know, only now, this, this is a, an aside, but there's a, an argument in the book about a teacher of mine Different, a different teacher from the one I mentioned before. I, everybody appears one time. Everybody gets their one, their one argument. But this teacher uh, was uh, an old poet, sort of like um, tried to channel the look of Walt Whitman, big beard. And he uh, told us one day that he had, you know, 
gotten 50 bucks to do some psychiatric test at the medical school where he taught. He didn't teach at the medical part of the school. And he was given this box, apparently this is like a very well-known test, a box of um, a lot of assorted objects and was asked to put them in order. And what they do is they time how long it takes you to determine that there is no order that can be made of these, you know, this group of things. But apparently he like took it, you know, he spent all day and, and they finally told him, you know, you have to stop. Um, you can't, this can't be done. And he was so proud. He loved telling this story because he said it meant that he had schizophrenic tendencies, which, you know, if you're a poet, that's like, <laughs> it's the greatest, um, it's the greatest, it's one of the greatest validations. I basically, I, I tricked myself into putting seven groups of 50 things in order, or, you know, 40 something things in order. And, um, and then I put them all next to each other and sort of dealt with the, the gaps and tried to close them up. And then I just, you just do it until you can't look at it anymore and then it's done. Mm -hmm. or, or like every time you look at it, it's the same. It's, and so, and, and that was it. Mm, and you, it you stopped, fi you stopped fussing. You stopped fiddling, point. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was different from other books I've, I've made only in degree because there were 300 things this time and the other ones are, you know, like 48 to 100 and something. Um, yes? Um, you mentioned that you write things in your journal and I remember an ongoing list you talked about the end of your diary and the mm -hmm. way you would talk about the difference between your journal and that diary, if the diary has Oh, I call it a diary. So it's, it, it is indeed that diary. And I, I only call it a diary because that, again, comes from Latin, that old and beautiful language and not French, um, which I like a lot less than Latin. Um, but I, you know, I know that the word diary is a sort of feminine word and journal is like a more manly, serious literary word. And, every, you know, again, I got so much good advice about the subtitle of ongoingness, which is the end of a diary. And I'm like, are you sure? You know, it's like you have a baby in it. Like you don't want it to be like so female. And, and I was like, Latin, I, I can't, I can't. It has to be the Latin. <laughs> so even though nobody knows, like with the word argument, even though nobody should care, um, um, yeah, yes, but yeah, it's, it's all the same diary. I wonder if your Latin training helped you write these. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's one of the only things that helped me write anything. Yeah. <laughs> but, Seriously. But this in particular, it seems like the way, at least for the reader who has to pay attention to understand the last line, yeah. it's a little bit like reading a, a lot of Latin authors where you feel the thing click shut in it, its hole. Yeah, you know, the nicest response I got, one of the nicest things anybody said about this was from David Shields, and his first thing he said to me was, your Latin is showing. Mm. And I thought, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only I were still uh, trying to meet boys with my author photos. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> Ew. Yeah, no. Gross. We're old friends, yep. Um, first of all, I definitely understand the, uh, the Boston book. I have oh, a yeah. Boston book of my own, sort of something I can conceptualize, but not really yeah. yet. Um, but I'm curious, you said you were relieved when you got to 300. Uh, did you literally write 300 and stop, or was it more like you wrote 846 and then yeah, no. 546 and got to 300 good ones? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. 300 that I could live with. It wasn't, I did not write 846, though. It's more like... I don't know, 480. <coughs> Just guessing. Sorry, I over I overlooked you. You were very politely holding your hand not too high. I, I had another question about your bio, actually. Is uh -huh. it the St. Mary's College, the, the one in Marauder? Yes, but I don't live there anymore. I live in LA now, and I teach at Scripps. Oh, okay. Yeah. What was St. What was like teaching at St. Mary's College and in Moraga as compared to Rome and New York and New York? Well, it's not Rome or New York. Um, I lived in the Bay with my family for a little over a year. And um, we've moved 
around a lot in the last five years. Um, my spouse works in tech, and they like to kind of just, you know, move them around uh, New York, LA, and San Francisco. And I just sort of, you know, grab whatever adjunct teaching I can, I can do wherever we are at the time. And, um, you know, we, we've settled down. That's all done now. And, um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to have a semester at St. Mary's while we were up there. And it was a great place to work. It was a, re a really beautiful drive. Um, From... uh, we were in the East Bay in Alameda, mm -hmm. but I would drive through these ma real mountains. You know, like your ears would get all fucked up mm -hmm. and then go down these beautiful valleys. And um, yeah, it was, it was really lovely. It was a great place to teach. Are you, do you have a connection up there? I went or? to middle school. And Oh, Moraga. Oh, Moraga. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm from the East Bay, but I, right. I just found that it really stuck out. Yeah, no, it's actually a really, really um, good uh, writing program yeah. at St. Mary's. Yeah, great poetry program, particularly. Yeah. Yes? Um, did you return to any books or your other works that you were writing this semester? Oh, I have to answer truthfully. I did look at Pascal and Flaubert's Dictionary, which is one of my favorite books, and um, books of uh, books of, if we can say, like the canonical aphoristic collections, to see how good they had to be. Hmm. And um, and yet, that that wasn't really the best way for me to write them in the end because. At least many of people, many people who were writing what they called aphorisms were basically philosophers until the middle of the 20th century, and it's just it has different goals, you know. It, it it's it's literary up to a point, but it's really it's not um, employing language in the way that I wanted to. The way I wanted to was I don't know. I mean, maybe it's like a, just an incredibly contemporary thing that I wanted, but I wanted them to be funny. I, I wanted them to be able to be funny and sad, and you know all of those feelings we get when we watch TV. Um, so, uh, in the end, in the end, I think the the best books were just the ones by what I con what I consider kind of the contemporary masters of the form: James Richardson, as I mentioned, Don Patterson. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot of people. Um, but yeah, people who are poets, actually. People who are, who are sort of primarily or professionally poets are the ones who are, I think, really, really good at writing short, short, short prose. Also, hello, Alexis, former student. <laughs> yes? Um, one of the arguments you read in Purdue if I mess up the wording was about um, um, pulling the trigger when you see uh -huh. uh, confess your greatest shame right away, everything else is exposition. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering, do you think that that sort of artistic philosophy can be reconciled with like a 400-word novel? Sort of that, that 400-word novel? <laughs> oh, page <laughs> novel? Uh, page novel, just the big uh, sort of fat yeah. kind of book. Or are those two things sort no. of fundamentally opposed? No, no. And, and I mean, you, you're correctly hearing um, my sort of uh, very quiet and literary tantrum that I'm having in this book for not being able to write a 400-page novel. You, you know, there, there's one in here where a friend of mine, a novelist, says, don't forget, they pay by the pound, trying to get me to write over 200 pages. Um, but all, everything, it's, it's, all just, it's all just about me. I mean, this, this is my, um, my midlife crisis book. It's the one, it, you know, it's, which, There, there are these, you know, basic shared understandings of what a midlife crisis is. But, um, but a crisis is a wonderful thing. I mean, it's an, and, and it was an immensely clarifying time. And I, I, I got to the point at which I, no longer, you know, at least for the next little while, I no longer feel like I, am not doing it right if I don't produce a 400 or 800 page novel. Um, writing, writing this book gave me a little respite from that. Regret that and that shame. Yes. Um, how are these arguments different from your poetry? 
Well, they're in prose and they're not poems. It's well, it's it's a well, it's a formal distinction, um, and, and I guess it's because uh, I I don't really see um, you know a conflict between a subject that could only be in a poem versus a subject that could only be in prose. I I don't I don't think there really are any other. Um, distinctions that I can really make between poetry and prose. Um, actually, there's somebody else in the audience here. Um, uh, Sebastian, a composer. Sebastian, comma, a composer. Um, I remember when I met you, I, I asked, oh, is your music tonal or atonal? And you said, oh, I don't really, I don't really observe a conflict between those two terms. And that, that just opened up something huge for me in that moment. I don't know if I've ever told you that. Um, but it, seem, it seems relevant here. It's, um, it kind of gave me the opportunity to stop worrying about whether something is you know, a poem or prose. Well, I mean, you keep talking about not being able to do the larger mm -hmm. work, and yet this seems more alive with writing and poetry. Yeah, I, I do that too sometimes. Because it's, it's a short form. Yeah, I, and, I, and I do, I, I am guilty of that also, that form. It's, it's not guilt, that's who you are. Well, it's funny if I can play devil's advocate. You just, you just, we just in the Paris Review published a poem of mm -hmm. yours, and it was so different from the. Maybe it's not a, a matter of genre, but it was so different from mm -hmm. these. And I would have said the first thing about it, it was longer than an argument, though it's a short poem. Yeah. But also, it was, uh, it wasn't. Um, it didn't. It wasn't. It didn't wear its guts on the outside. I mean, it, it didn't show. It wasn't mm -hmm. articulated the way these are. Mm -hmm. These, if I were puzzled by one of the arguments, I, I have been puzzled by them. I stare at them and I look at them the way I look at the like Wednesday crossword puzzle or the Thursday crossword puzzle, mm -hmm. with some confidence that, given enough time and patience, <laughs> it will become clear. <laughs> the poem I'm thinking of, for example was more like a Saturday crossword. I mean, oh, I could give it, it would be rewarding to me to give it a lot of time. But I might not But come. you might not have that much time. No, I would. I have had that much time. I've thought a lot about that poem. But, I, but my feelings aren't resolved in, in the same way that they are. About that, is, that is very helpful. Perhaps I will be able to answer uh, more satisfactorily. There's something about that poem and I, that I think <clears throat> Other of my poems, yeah, I, I think with my poems there's a level of or an amount of interference between me and the subject or you know the purported subject, and for these there's no interference. I'm looking right at it. I can see it. These are clear, and the poems are are not like the the interference is part of the form. It's it's you know it's in, it's inextricable from the practice of writing it, and I think the practice, you know, reading it, if if an actual poem comes out of it. I have to say, to me, that is a that is a real cleft in your work, between not just these and that, but between a kind of clarity that I'm not saying it comes easy to you, but you make it look easy, you make it look fast, even if it's slow. Mm -hmm. it's but there's a kind of clarity, blinding, sometimes scary, sometimes aggressive, sometimes. Oh, overwhelming, and then a kind of creation of, not privacy exactly, but drawing a veil and letting things happen that are not going to be scrutinized, that are not going to be made plain, not going to be articulated. Plain, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I don't know. That's very astute. I think you're right. We have time for one more. Okay. I, I can't choose. Here, somebody <laughs> else do it. Maybe. Yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> um, Jenny Walter's truisms rely so strongly on context, not just the way you frame it in the context of the other truisms, but in that physical space. I mean, in the 80s and 90s, they were on t-shirts and right. milk cartons and benches and buildings. And I'm wondering if that specificity of location and of objectness, was that all a factor when you were looking at them as an influence? 
No, because I had the posters, and I, it was almost like I wore them. They were, they were all around me in a little room. I mean, they covered really like all, all available wall space. As I, you know, some of you saw my Smith Street apartment and whenever that was. And um, yeah, it was like a cot, a desk, and eight giant Jenny Holzer posters. Um, I do love them in the other forms, but for me, having them in that long alphabetized list was um, very pleasing, and I think it really, it really infected me, I, and not in, a, not in a bad way. It infiltrated, I guess, um, my, my brain in this, what seems like a permanent way.